Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Anupama Chaudhary Devgan, your physiology faculty, and this is the daily quiz series in the run-up to NEET PG 2025. This week, I am dealing with endocrinology and some miscellaneous topics in physiology. So let's have a look at the first question. This says, a 10-year-old boy is being evaluated for poor growth. His height is below the third percentile for age. So short stature, he has childlike faces, a delayed dentition and increased subcutaneous fat. There are low levels of IGF-1 and poor response to insulin-induced hypoglycemia stimulation test. Now, what happens in an insulin-induced hypoglycemia test? The moment you give inject insulin, there is hypoglycemia, which in turn causes an increase in growth hormone. Growth hormone is one of the very important stress hormones. And growth hormone will in turn cause a glycogenolysis and increase the blood glucose level. Now, this says there is a poor response to insulin-induced hypoglycemia, so we do not see this. MRI of the brain shows a very small pituitary gland. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Is it Laron dwarfism, hypothyroidism, constitutional growth delay and growth hormone deficiency? This is pointing more towards a growth hormone deficiency. Now, especially the small pituitary gland. Now, what is Laron dwarfism? Now, Laron dwarfism is a growth hormone insensitivity. That means growth hormone is not able to act on its receptors. There is a mutation of the gene which is responsible for the growth hormone receptor. Now, normally, growth hormone acts on the liver and liver produces IGF-1. So, if there is a growth hormone insensitivity, we expect no IGF-1 to be produced. But what will happen to the growth hormone levels? Growth hormone levels may be normal or even high. So a small pituitary gland, which is pointing more towards a growth hormone deficiency rather than a Laurent dwarfism. Laboratory tests will help us distinguish between growth hormone deficiency or Laurent dwarfism because obviously in growth hormone deficiency, low GH and low IGF-1 levels, but in Laurent dwarfism, GH levels may be normal or even high. Hypothyroidism, dwarfism in hypothyroidism is associated with a mental retardation. So the, the history is not pointing towards that. Plus, of course, the small pituitary gland giving us a definitive diagnosis of a growth hormone deficiency. A 35-year-old woman presents with complaints of weight loss, heat intolerance, palpitations, increased appetite. So this is pointing towards a hyperthyroidism. She is a diffusely enlarged, a diffusely enlarged and a non-tender thyroid gland. In subacute thyroiditis, it is a tender thyroid gland. Tenderness is present, so this is not the answer here. Uh, there are also fine tremors and mild exophthalmos. Her TSH is suppressed and free T4 is elevated. This is pointing towards Graves' disease. Graves' disease is characterized by very high T4 levels and TSH levels are suppressed. In a toxic multinodular goiter, I expect the gland to be enlarged. In this case, it says it's a diffusely enlarged. In a multinodular goiter, multiple nodules should be pal palpable. Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Hashimoto's thyroiditis is uh, associated with hypothyroidism and not with hyperthyroidism. The clinical picture here is a typical hyperthyroidism. So my answer here is Graves' disease. Action of the thyroid hormone is mediated by which of the following receptors? Are these cytoplasmic or nuclear receptors? Thyroid hormones Thyroid hormone is a lipid-soluble hormone and lipid-soluble hormones can have either cytoplasmic or nuclear receptors. 
Lipid soluble hormones can cross the cell membrane. They can enter into the cells. So the receptors may be either in the cytoplasm or in the nucleus. For water soluble hormones, the receptors will have to be on the membrane surface and all water soluble hormones will use second messengers for their action. But lipid soluble hormones, like I said, can cross the cell membrane. Now, which are the lipid soluble hormones which have got nuclear receptors? Thyroid and estrogen. These are two which have got nuclear receptors. Progesterone, testosterone, cortisol, glucocorticoids, aldosterone. These have cytoplasmic receptors. So please remember two hormones which have got nuclear receptors are thyroid and estrogen. So the answer to this question is a nuclear receptor. Two hormones whose receptor itself has tyrosine kinase activity. These are two water soluble hormones which do not require second messenger because the receptor itself has tyrosine kinase activity. This is insulin and IGF-1. The receptor itself has tyrosine kinase activity. Which of the following is not an action of parathormone? Parathormone increases bone resorption. That is true. Please remember parathormone receptors are on osteoblasts but osteoblasts secrete something known as rank ligand which in turn increases the monocyte colony stimulating factor and the monocyte colony stimulating factor acts on osteoclastic precursor cells to to enhance their maturation to form mature osteoclasts. So even though the parathormone receptor is present on the osteoblast, but it causes a secondary increase in osteoclastic activity, so it increases bone resorption. It increases the calcium reabsorption in the kidney. This is true. It acts on the DCT and increases the calcium reabsorption. Does it increase the phosphate reabsorption? This is false. What is the effect of parathormone on uh, the PCT? In the PCT, parathormone inhibits the sodium inorganic phosphorus co-transport. Inorganic phosphorus and phosphate mean the same thing. So if it inhibits this sodium inorganic phosphorus co-transport, it increases the urinary loss of inorganic phosphorus, which is called a phosphaturic action of parathormone. So parathormone reduces phosphate reabsorption. In the DCT, on the other hand, parathormone increases calcium reabsorption. What is the effect of parathormone on calcitriol? Parathormone increases the calcitriol synthesis. Parathormone will increase the activity of one alpha hydroxylase enzyme in the kidney. One alpha hydroxylase is responsible for the conversion of, uh, of 25 hydroxycholecalciferol to 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol, which is the active form of vitamin D. So it increases calcitriol synthesis. Answer here is C. A 28-year-old trekker travels from sea level to an altitude of 4,000 meters over two days. On the third day, he develops headache, fatigue, nausea, and difficulty in sleeping. His oxygen saturation is 86%, lower than normal. We expect uh, normal arterial oxygen saturation to be about 97 to 98%. Hyper Examination reveals no signs of pulmonary or cerebral edema. Which of the following best explains his symptoms? Is it a respiratory acidosis? Is it acute mountain sickness? Is it carbon monoxide poisoning or pulmonary embolism? He has moved to a high altitude. So that's the first hint. This is an acute mountain sickness due to hypobaric hypoxia. What is hypobaric hypoxia? In high altitude, we expect 
what has happened to the atmospheric pressure that is reduced. This is called hyperbaric atmosphere, hyperbaric conditions. If there is a reduction in the atmospheric pressure, it also decreases the partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere. This in turn causes what is known as a hypoxic hypoxia. What is hypoxic hypoxia? Here the PO2 is reduced and saturation is also reduced. And the reason for this uh, hypoxic hypoxia is the reduction in the atmospheric pressure and the reduction in the partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere. Now, whenever there is a decrease in PO2, it causes a vasodilation. All blood vessels tend to dilate except in the lungs. In the lungs, hypoxia produces a pulmonary vasoconstriction. So if there is a vasodilation, there is a cerebral vasodilation as well, and that results in headache. So one of the uh, symptoms here he has come with is headache. Now let's have a look at what do you understand by acclimatization. Now, the first thing is acclimatization takes about two to three days. Now, when we reach a high altitude area, there is hypoxic hypoxia. And this hypoxic hypoxia stimulates the peripheral chemoreceptors, which increase the rate and depth of ventilation. Increasing rate and depth of ventilation means there is an increase in the total ventilation, increase in alveolar ventilation, which is also known as hyperventilation. This results in a CO2 washout and which in turn causes a respiratory alkalosis. So what happens in high altitude because of the hypoxia is a respiratory alkalosis. And what is the effect of alkalosis on the peripheral chemoreceptors? It starts suppressing the peripheral chemoreceptors. Now, to counter this effect, we undergo a process of acclimatization and which takes about two to three days, 48 to 72 hours. So the first 48 to 72 hours, when you reach a, a high altitude area, your respiratory drive is suppressed. So the advice that you're given is, that do not perform any sort of physical activity in the first two to three days. You are supposed to only rest in your hotel. You're supposed to just lie in bed, read a book or watch television, or uh, but no physical exertion. Because during this time, your respiratory drive is suppressed. Physical exertion means increase the oxygen demand, but your uh, uh, body is not able to supply that oxygen because the respiratory drive is suppressed. Acclimatization, like I said, takes two to three days. What happens during an acclimatization? Number one, there is increase in the erythropoietin release. This increases the red cell mass. This happens within the first 24 to 48 hours. Then over 48 to 72 hours, there is an increased renal excretion of bicarbonates. This in turn will now cause a decrease in the pH. Excess bicarbonates are removed by the kidney. So if there's a fall in the pH, now remember, alkalosis was suppressing the drive, the respiratory drive, suppressing the peripheral chemoreceptors. If I correct this alkalosis, if I bring the pH uh, back to normal or almost back to normal, at least that inhibitory effect of alkalosis on the respiratory drive is remo removed and the peripheral chemoreceptors can respond to the hypoxia. The third thing which can happen is there is an increase in 2,3 BPG and this shifts the oxygen hemoglobin disassociation curve to the right and rightward shift means more delivery of oxygen to the tissues. 
at the tissue level there is an increase in capillary density there is increase in the number of mitochondria there is increase in the number of uh, enzyme cytochrome enzymes basically to increase the oxygen utilization at the tissue level this is the process of acclimatization if acclimatization does not occur properly the patient can go into what is known as acute mountain sickness acute mountain sickness can be mild like in this case where there is headache uh, where there is nausea vomiting there is fatigue there is sleep disturbances or it can take on a very severe form there could be high altitude cerebral edema and high altitude pulmonary edema 